Aloha and welcome to the weekend, everybody. Uh, we're doing a live stream today about Tartaria. Thank you so much for everybody who's waiting in the live stream. Uh, I was just handling a few last minute things here on my side, but we're ready to kick things off. So let's jump right into the subject. I have a lot of things that I'm going to put on the screen to share with everybody so that we can uh, get a lot of good visual examples and stuff. Like for example, right here next to me, there's just four examples of a land or a region that's called Tartaria. <clears throat> Tartaria, just as it's shown on many different ancient maps. It was really interesting too because... Um, the subject of Tartaria and who are the Tartarians and uh, the Tartarian Empire and Grand Tartary, etc. Uh, it's come up time and time again in a lot of esoteric and independent research lately, as well it should, because it's kind of a mystery. It's kind of strange that this region and this land shows up called Greater Tartary or the Tatars or the Tartars or the Tartarian Empire. And it, it shows us um, all these different examples on various maps over time. And yet, whenever we go through our indoctrination and our, our educational um, schooling and whatnot, we're not told a whole lot about it. Nobody really expands upon who these tribes are or who this tribe of people or, or, or what this, what this uh, country is, if it's a country, etc. So what I wanted to do, many people have been asking me, to go into more detail, into more depth about who I believe the Tartarians are and where they come from more specifically. So today we're talking about the origins of Tartaria. What does Tartaria mean? Where does that word come from? What is the etymological root and what is the origin for that word? And where do uh, where do these regions on these maps, where, where, where did they come from and where do the Tartarians themselves originate from? So that's what we're going to dive into today. Uh, thank you once again, everybody in the live chat. Super appreciate you. Sorry I was late today. And if you're watching in the future, enjoy the show. All right, cool. So first things first, we're going to start off by uh, by breaking down the word. We're going to break down the word itself, which means I'm going to start doing some screen sharing and I'm going to put some stuff up here for everybody to see. That's our live stream there. Oh, you know what? Let's do this. Before we get right into the meat and potatoes of the presentation, let's give a little backstory, shall we? So I was doing my research on Tartaria as, as I have, and I came across a Wikipedia article on the Tartarian Empire. And I thought it was very interesting because, let me show you this, it says conspiracy theory, <laughs> which I thought was really interesting. I, I, I for sure thought that whenever I looked this up on Wikipedia, that it would really get into like, you know, the, the reality behind the Tartarian Empire and, and who they were and stuff. But no, not really. It, it mainly focuses on the concept being presented as a conspiracy theory instead of a reality, which really blew my mind because it's it's evident that it was there. It's evident that it's it's a uh, you know a a tribe or a nation of people spread across the map, right? So we're going to look at many different examples and we're going to zoom in and check out a lot of cool stuff on some maps tonight. So let's read this one first, so that way we can get a little backstory on what's going on in uh in the truther community for those of us who are researching Tartaria and how that appears to the general populations, which is what we're going to start off with, right? So this is what they say, the Tartarian empire, a conspiracy theory. Hey, Debbie, thank you. I appreciate it. Dar uh, Tartarian empire, a conspiracy theory. It says Tartary or Tartaria is a historical name for central Asia and Siberia. Ignorance surrounding Tartary's use as a place name was spawned, uh, has spawned conspiracy theories, including ideas of a hidden past, mud floods. That, that one kind of blew my mind that Wikipedia is jumping on the mud flood stuff too. Um, and such theories assert that Tartary or the Tartarian Empire was a lost civilization with advanced technology and culture. This ignores the well-documented history of Asia. Now, I want, let's 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 time out real quick. Okay, I want to I want to comment on some of this as we go because I can't hold my tongue on some of it. Right? All right, let me scooch it up just a bit. Let's back up just a bit here. So it says that it's a historic or a historical name for Central Asia and Siberia. No. 
That was the original name for Central Asia and Siberia, at least various parts of it, right? Uh, they were not always called Central Asia or Siberia, right? And even if you, if you talk to people who live in Russia, there are many Russians who will share this uh, same sentiment with you, that they believe that, um, that Tartary was actually the original name instead of Russia, which I believe this article makes a, a mention or a reference to. It goes on to say, Drew, hey, thanks, Drew, I appreciate you. All right, cool. It goes on to say um, uh, that it spawns conspiracy theories. No, 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 it doesn't at all. Like there, I don't, I don't know of any conspiracy that is involved in Tartaria except for this is unknown information. Just because something's unknown does not mean it automatically becomes a conspiracy. Who's conspiring? You know what I mean? Like. I mean, there, I'm sure there could, could be some people that are saying that uh, the rulers of our world have conspired to leave this out of the educational system, in which case it's evident it's not in the educational system, at least the one that I went through. I'm speaking from personal experience. They may have made a quick mention of it as a place name, but never got into the details of why it's called that or who those people were or their past or anything like that, right? That doesn't make it a conspiracy just because people are researching. Just because people are looking into it doesn't mean it's some wacko tinfoil hat conspiracy. So I completely disagree with that. Um, I would say it does spawn theories because people are curious. People want to know more. They want to know about it, right? So that's why we're doing the show tonight. Uh, including ideas of a hidden past and mud floods, which we'll also discuss. Such theories assert that now this is this is in general. I have no idea who these people watch. And it's clear. It's obvious to me that they're watching YouTube. So maybe they're watching my channel, maybe they're watching other people's channels, I'm not really sure. But obviously this is a, this is a whole article and this person is basing this off of whatever small amount of research they seem to have done. Uh, Tartary or the Tartarian Empire was a lost civilization. Okay, well, if, if there were a people named the Tartars, which by the way, they still exist to this day. So there are a people called the Tartars, okay? Um, so it's not... It's not exactly a, a lost civilization, but I'm going to expound upon that in this video. Um, Tartarian Empire was a lost civilization with advanced technology and culture. So it, this is something that the mainstream has a big problem with is attributing antiquitech or ancient technology to the past because they feel like we're superior in the modern age because we're in the modern age. As a matter of fact, I tend to believe that that's how many people of the general population probably have felt all throughout time in their modern age, that they are superior and going further back, you know, it's, it's degraded or whatever. At least that's how it is today. I have found in the past, many of our ancestors, our recent ancestors, will acknowledge and have acknowledged um, in their myths and their legends and religions and whatnot, that the further back in time we go and research, actually we find that um, um, many different examples of people being healthier and more intelligent than they are today, right? Um, and there's the, the fact, <laughs> the fact that there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that are researching this. Matt Kubis, hey, good to see you, Matt. <laughs> um, that there are so many people that are, that are researching this speaks volumes on its own, right? So let's continue on. It says, this ignores well-documented, doesn't say who documented or what, they're, just, they're speaking about modern academics. The well-documented history of Asia, which Tartary refers to. In the present day, the Tartary region covers a region spanning from central Afghanistan to northern Kazakhstan. I would also, I'm going to show you evidence that it actually spanned much further than that in this video. Uh, as well as areas in present Mongolia, China, we're going to talk about Mon the Mongols, uh, Mongolia, China, and Russia in the Far East, in Chinese Tartary. Okay, like if they don't represent a people or a nation, then why would you even call it Chinese Tartary? You know what I mean? It seems a bit contradictory. Let's check out what they say about the background. The theory of Great Tartaria is a suppressed lost land or civilization originated in Russia with aspects first appearing in Anatoly 
Fomenko's new chronology and then popularized by the racial occult history of Nikolai Levashov. So do you see how they kind of throw in some racial stuff in there to, to, to give it a bad flavor or a bad taste, especially in the modern age when people are so divided? Um, they're quick. People are quick to be divided these days, whether it be race or sex or religion or whatever it may be, right? They're quick to do that so that they can get people to try to side with them. Because you can tell there's a slant on this article, right? Uh, it says, in Russian pseudoscience, that means fake science, by the way, which is not fake science. It's just not science that's approved by mainstream academics. So they'll put all kinds of subjects that are well known, extremely well researched and uh, have more history to them than, than much of what we call modern science. They'll put all of that stuff into a category called pseudoscience, which today is kind of like calling something a conspiracy theory. It basically is a dismissal of it, right? They just dismiss it and say, oh, it's pseudoscience. That's fake science, right? Uh, just like um, extra biblical writings oftentimes are called or referred to as the pseudopigrapha or the false writings, right? So they're trying to get people to adhere to their official stories and their official teachings, which on this subject isn't much, if you ask me. Uh, let's see. It's uh, known in, in Russian pseudoscience, known for its nationalism. Okay. Yes, that's true. <laughs> but... Um, I don't know. Anyways, it's the same thing over and over. They're just trying to put a bad taste in your mouth. Tartaria is represented as the real name for Russia, which I mean, I tend to agree with. Now, let's let me tell you this. Russia is just a descriptor, okay? It's not a name. We don't Today we have names, which are just name tags that we slap on stuff that we have no idea what they mean any longer, right? And the names of people and places and stuff have changed over time. So, what they're arguing is that that's not the official name for Russia that has been recognized by the rest of the modern world, right? I just want to double check the chat. Okay, cool. I just want to make sure we're good. All right, so let's continue on. Uh, and it, it says here, which was maliciously ignored in the West. Yes, I, I, I don't know if it was maliciously ignored, but you know, that's just, that's people's languages. They take their languages and they take what resonates with them and the words that work for them. It doesn't mean it was malicious. You know, I, I wouldn't jump to that conclusion right away. The Russian Geographical Society has debunked. Oh, I love that word. Not really. <laughs> Uh, has debunked the conspiracy theory of as an extremist fantasy and far from denying the existence of the term has used the opportunity to share numerous maps of Tartary in its collection. So basically what they're saying is that um, the people in Russia used this as an opportunity because the conspiracy theory is that like this is a hidden land and they're hiding it from everybody. So the people in Russia who don't support actually researching this, they come out and they have a double-edged sword by presenting the information saying, look, it's right there on our map. Look at all these times we put it on the map. Yes, it's on the map, but you're not, you're not going into detail about the history or the origins of that, which what we're going to do today. Uh, it says, since about 2016, conspiracy theories uh, about the supposed lost empire of Tartaria. Well, I'm going to also say this. It's, it's not there anymore. <laughs> like it's it, it he just said whoever wrote this just said it's it's you know russia's sh showing tartaria on maps to say look we're not hiding anything so they're saying uh since 2016 conspiracy theories about the supposed lost empire of tartaria it's 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 it is lost it's gone okay so if if, if by if by lost we mean it's no longer there and it's not really spoken of or taught about accurately and in detail, then yeah, it's, I consider it to be lost. Um, conspiracy theories about the supposed lost empire of Tartaria have gained popularity on the internet. So somebody's going through the internet and they got it. They got an issue with the, with the whole research, right? Divorced from its original Russian nationalist frame. All right, let's continue on the conspiracy theory. Ooh, the globalized version of the conspiracy theory is based on an alternative view of architectural history. Adherents proposed that demolished buildings such as the Singer Building, the original New York Penn Station, or the temporary grounds of the 1915 World's Fair were actually the buildings of a vast empire based in Tartary that has been suppressed from history. So I'm going to time out right there. That's all this person's opinion and their perspective on something that doesn't seem like they've done a lot of research into. 
um, about whatever few research they have done. Does that make sense? Right. So they, they may have, you know, watched a handful of YouTube videos or whatever. Then when there were, when there are thousands of people who are researching this and talking about this, my, myself included, so I'm pe- speaking from experience. Um, and, and it, it seems like they just don't get it. So they're basically saying it's all false. It's all made up and it's all a lie. Let's check these buildings out real quick. See if they have an example. Uh, they don't really have a really good example of these, but I will just explain this, right? Many people have taken a second look at ancient architecture and um, they have noticed certain trends like this building right here, right? Um, Why would they build this building in this particular fashion? Why did they have this certain style of these columns? Typically four main columns in the front that protrude and stick up. Why do they have these obelisks? And why do they have a gigantic dome? How is it beneficial to the architecture of the building? Right? I mean, what it, it, if it doesn't do anything, if it doesn't add to uh, the buildings and it's just for art, for the sake of art, then I would expect there to be a multitude of various types of architecture and completely opposing and different looking buildings. But we don't find that. We find the very same similar types of structures uh, with spires and domes all over the place, a Gothic style. That's like, I mean, we know Gothic style architecture exists. That's um, the question is why? Why does it exist? Why does it look like that? Did it serve a purpose? I don't think that we should dismiss a person just because they ask these questions. They want to know more about this, right? And it makes sense to look back into our past to try to figure out things that don't make sense in the present, right? Um, But mainstream academics has a big fat problem with that because they have rewritten the past and they would like it. It's like 1984. They just rewrote the news, rewrote history, and um, they're getting upset that independent researchers are coming up with their own ideas and coming to their own conclusions or having their own theories and thoughts on the matter, right? I will tell you, this is my personal opinion on this, that w- that our atmosphere has changed over time, right? And the architecture indicates, if you, if you look at it from an electromagnetic or energetic viewpoint, it indicates that um, some people lived during a time when there was an abundance of electricity in our atmosphere. Nikola Tesla is a prime example of somebody who studied and researched this, um, won various uh, um, acclaims and and awards, and um, he was highly acclaimed as, as, as somebody who knew what he was doing. And he looked into these types of things of drawing energy from the ether itself or from the earth herself, right? Um, so that's what we're doing. We're following in the footsteps of greatness, which to me is Nikola Tesla because he's, you know, somebody that I admire. I admire his work. All right. Um, so I, I'm just going to give an example. For example, right? Electromagnetically, when you have a dome like this in an electro and in, in a highly charged, uh, electro electric environment, the dome will tend to attract electricity to it. And during an age or an era where you don't have a lot of uh, electricity or lights or, or, or stuff like that, and you have it in the air where you can just manipulate it and draw it down and you don't have to pay governments and other people for the privilege of using something that is created naturally and in abundance by the earth herself, um, then you you do that. And this is what this does. Now, those little spiky deals, those act exactly as, and I believe they are, a type of lightning rod, which tends to keep away uh, the lightning so it doesn't hit anywhere else but where that dome is. Domes attract and the spires repel, which means um, if... You know, if we use that same logic and reasoning that Gothic styles, which are, which are more spires and spiky all over the place, that those were designed to keep electricity away from that building so that cosmic blasts or thunderbolts from the God didn't just come down and destroy a major metropolitan area, which is also, if we use that same line of thought, um, it stands to reason that that could also be one of the reasons that obelisks were erected in town centers and in in major uh, populated areas, right? All right, cool. Um, Let's continue reading. Uh, Let's see. Talked about the World's Fair, actually buildings of a vast empire. Tartary, it was a vast empire. 
Um, the, the thing about Tartary is that they didn't settle. They were nomads, which is also what we're going to go into detail and talk about. Um, I mean, not in general. Okay. I'm just saying in general, they were known to be nomadic in nature. It doesn't mean that none of them settled. It doesn't mean that none of them, you know, built architecture and, and wondrous things like that. All right, let's continue on. Uh, let's see. They say that it's been suppressed from history. Well, if this is true, then it has been suppressed from history purposefully or accidentally. I can't say, but it's, it, if that's true, then it's obvious it has been suppressed. Uh, sumptuously styled Gilded Age buildings are often held out as really having been built by the supposed Tartaria or the Tartars or the Tatars, right? Other buildings such as the Great Pyramids and the White House uh, are further held out as Tartarian buildings. I would also tend to agree with that style, that style that people are labeling Tartarian architecture, right? Which is very similar to like a sort of a Gothic Middle Eastern type of a look, right? Um, that the White House does share that. It's got the, the, the pillars in the front, right? And I've explained those pillars symbolically what they represent. They represent actual things in our world that used to exist, but they are not here at the present time. Um, it's not just artsy. It's not just, oh, it's just a pretty style. You know, there's a, probably a million different styles of uh, architecture that could even be better and more structurally sound than the ones that they're building in this type of an environment. Um, but the White House has those pillars and then it's got the triangle or the, the pyramid on top of it, right? And you'll see that same style of architecture when you go further back in time. The Great Pyramids, they can't even tell us who built the Great Pyramid. I mean, don't actually, let me take that back. They do tell us who built the Great Pyramids, but their guesses as to who built the Great Pyramids are akin to their guesses as to where the moon came from, right? Which is like four completely different opposing theories, right? All right, let's continue on. Um, the White House, etc., are further held out as Tartarian buildings. The conspiracy theory only vaguely descri describes how such a supposedly advanced civilization, uh, which had re reputedly achieved world peace, could have fallen but have been hidden. I'm going to tell you my theory on exactly how Tartaria has been hidden. Uh, we'll get to that after this article. In the conspiracy theory, which it's not, I've, I've never, I, I, I've never, I, I love researching Tartaria. I love researching all of the stuff that they've already mentioned previously. That doesn't mean that there's some sort of a conspiracy to it, right? I mean, we kind of, we mentioned that, so I'm not going to get into that again too much. But once again, they're just throwing out these, uh, these clickbaity kind of, you know, emotional words to get people charged up and on, on their side about the matter. Uh, in the conspiracy theory, the idea that a mud flood wiped out much of the world via depopulation, let's time out real quick, that is an apocalyptic event, okay? Let me explain this to whoever wrote this article and to anybody that might not understand how it would be possible for mud to flood the world worldwide, right? Or across much of the world. All you need is for the world to shake. That's it. Right? That's all you need is for the ground to shake and there to be worldwide earthquakes, which which is well documented that we have had small ones in the past, where the, whether it be Krakatoa or other volcanoes that have gone off, um, various seismic um, seismograph um, readings, you know that that have recorded that the entire world has has the ability to shake all everywhere at the same time. Now, if you increase that and you magnify that seismic activity, what happens is all of the water that is known to be inside of the Earth in the crust or under the crust, which they say is more water than in on the top where the ocean is, that water comes up to the top. It's called liquefaction and it is accepted by modern academics. It's just that they haven't connected the dots here. They don't understand that this is liquefaction in action. It is worldwide earthquakes that are all going off at the same time, which is causing uh, you know heavy things on top to sink down and hidden things down below to rise up as the waters come up from underneath and create mud or a swamp like like atmos um, terrain all over the place. All right. Um, I'm going to pop out my chat real quick. Cause I always, I, I always kind of get anxiety that, you know, maybe we're not live streaming. I got to make sure I keep my eye on the chat. Let's pop out the chat. All right. Boom. And thank you to everybody who's here in the chat as well. All right, cool. I got the chat just popped out a little bit. I'm not actually going to be in the chat. Cause I'm going to be doing this presentation here, but let's, let's continue on. 
All right, we'll get to these maps here in just a second. All right, so in the conspiracy theory, the idea of mud flood wiped out much of the world via depopulation, which is not inconceivable, as we've just discussed. Um, and thus, old buildings is common, supported by the fact that many buildings across the world have architectural elements like doors, windows, and archways that are submerged many feet below ground level. I find that to be, uh, I find that to have truth to it. I find that to be accurate that I have seen personally in real, my real waking, walking life examples of that, as well as many different examples that are on the internet. Um, and, I, and I'm sure we can find many different examples where things have been flooded and submerged and that there are, there are basement levels that are underground that didn't used to be basement levels. I mean, you can look at, um, uh, uh, what is that? What is that city in Italy that they say is sinking constantly? Right, that's a prime example. Um, and what was that city? Can you put it in the chat if you guys remember what that city was? It's the the water city. <laughs> you know, are they singing on gondolas? Totally. I'm. I got so much on my mind right now. But thank you. All right, continuing on. Uh, let's see. Both World War One and two are cited in a way in which Tartaria was destroyed and hidden, reflecting the reality that the extensive bombing campaigns of World War II did destroy many historic buildings. The general evidence for this theory is that there are similar styles of buildings around the world, such as capital buildings with domes or star forts. That seems valid based on my research, my independent research that I've done so far, and based on the many other researchers that all are coming up with the same exact conclusions and the same exact things. Also, they say, many photographs from the turn of the 20th century appear to show deserted city streets in many capital cities across the world. They do appear to show that. When people do start to appear in the photographs, there's a striking contrast between the horse and the cart dwellers in the muddy streets and the elaborate, highly ornate stone megastructures, uh, which tower above the inhabitants of the cities, which is seen even in modern cities where extreme poverty is contrasted with skyscrapers. Zach Mortis, writing, I don't know who that is, uh, writing for Bloomberg, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Uh, believes that the theory reflects a cultural discontent with modernism. Oh, let me translate that. Okay, I know what that means. Let me translate that for you. Some guy somewhere that writes for some magazine or something, he feels, whoever he is, uh, he feels that the that this theory of what they're calling a conspiracy theory, which I already said it's not, right? That people are researching this because it reflects our discontent with modernism, which means we just don't like the modern world so much that we're just gonna get lost on the internet and look at old pictures and old videos of the way things used to be because we just don't wanna be a part of the modern era. While there may be truth to that, right? I don't like the modern world. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that anything that I research about the past is just automatically false. You know what I mean? Where's the logic in that? That's not logical at all. Uh, discontent with modernism and a supposition that traditional styles are inherently good and modern styles are bad. This is a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, I totally disagree with whoever this guy is. He describes the theory as the QAnon of architecture. Well, hey, we'll take that as a compliment. You know, that's awesome that, that our work and our research is getting out there, even if people are disagreeing with it. That's fine. That's how it starts, right? That's how revolutions begin. That's how the world changes. That's how we all go in new directions. And, and that's the, those are the exact same types of things that our forefathers and the giants who came before us, that's what they did to bring us into this wonderful modern age. So be thankful that we do this type of stuff because you benefit, you benefit from it in the end. All right. So that was, uh, the crazy article I was reading about, um, what, you know, what, what mainstream believes about the Tartarian empire. Now we're going to dive into, uh, let's see. I don't want to look at the maps quite yet. What I would like to do is start from the beginning and I'm going to build a bridge for people who are unfamiliar with it. We're going to start with the word itself, the word Tartaria itself. Uh, let's see. Let's get rid of that one and let's check this one out. All right. Let me make sure these are in the correct order here. They are. All right, cool. Now, what you have before you is a small example of uh, the Hebrew alphabet, Lamed through Zayin, 
and their Phoenician counterparts, okay? We're going to take a look at number nine right here, right? This is the ninth letter of the Phoenician and the, um, or you could say the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet or the Aleph Bet. This is the letter Tet, okay? Tet is a root word for many, many different words in our modern languages. For example, Thoth. That's, a, that's an example for tet, okay? Uh, tattoo is another example. There's many different um, words that originate from this glyph right here. Take a look at this glyph. This glyph is a circle that has an X in the middle, or you could say it is separated by four lines that all meet in the middle. Now, this glyph, which we call tet, which is the root for tataria, okay? Now, let me back up just a skoosh, just a skosh, okay? Tartaria is a mispronunciation. However, it still works. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. The original word was not tartaria. It was tetaria. And those who lived there were known as the tetars or the tetors, right? Which over time became words like the tutors and things of that nature, right? They were known for being a very strong ruling class of citizens or people, we could say, um, tribe. So this word, tet, which is the root for tet aria or the Tatars or modern day Tartaria, this is the root, tet. And what it meant in its original picture form, because believe it or not, our letters in our alphabets actually were pictures if you go farther back in time. And what they would do is they would put picture and then another picture, and it would build context. Each glyph would give context to the other, which presented a message, which formed a sentence or a word, which gave rise to our modern alphabets and glyphs that we have today, which nobody understands the origin of, and they don't even know what the words that they're saying mean originally, let alone any of the letters. They just know A is the first one, B is the second one, and that's basically it, right? So let's learn. Tet, originally was a picture that conveyed, all of these pictures could convey many different things based on what other pictures were on either side of them, right? It gives more context the more pictures you have. But just alone, all by itself, it conveyed a basket or a something that holds, right? A snake, which is sometimes seen as a snake in a basket, and to surround. I say it meant all three of those, a basket with a snake surrounding it. That snake, I believe, based on my research and all of the, the hundreds of videos that I've done about the subject so far, that that snake was actually plasma. That's how they described plasma, especially cosmic plasma or atmospheric plasma, just like you see it today. Let me give you a modern example from the wonderful modern world, okay? Uh, UFOs sightings are on the rise. You could, you could pull it up on YouTube right now. You'll get a million brand new videos of strange lights that people are seeing in the sky because our sky is capable of producing light, right? Uh, it, it, it has plasma in the sky. It's, I mean, you can see the auroras, right? The auroras are stretching out further than they ever have. Those auroras, that plasma that is in the sky, when that when that energy in our atmosphere was much stronger, um, the auroras were much stronger and they were seen as snakes or serpents or dragons or fireworms or all kinds of other things. And that's exactly how they were described. Described. So when they put words like a snake, it can, it can by extension mean a snake, but they, they may not have actually put, oh, this represents plasma because they didn't know what plasma was, right? Possibly. It's just one possible explanation. But anyways, this is what it represents. Keep this symbol in mind. It's also the X-Men symbol. And uh, there's good reason for that. And you'll, you'll probably figure it out as we go along here. Now, um, let's go to our next thing. So Tet. The Tet is a location. Let me show you what the Tet represents originally. Let's go back to my screen sharing here. Boom and boom. All right, cool. So right now, we're going to take a look at um, Gerard Mer one of Gerard Mercator's map. This is his Arctic map, his map of the Arctic, right? So this is the North Pole. There is land, as you can see, four different lands right here with a central gigantic mountain exactly in the middle. And this land is circular and split. 
by four rivers, which all meet in the middle. You can also see that this land is a crater. There are mountains all the way around. This land is a valley. It is a bowl. It is a basket, you could say, right? It is a grail, basically. Um, let's see. So basically, this you can see that this is the exact same shape as the tet, right? And this is where that, that glyph comes from. This is the image of the tet. Also, it's interesting to note that sometimes this exact same image has been seen in the moon. There have been um, chronicles that have been written in, in history that have described uh, various cultures that have seen this sort of uh, an X marking over the moon or a cross over the moon. Very interesting. But my point here is that this is an official map. This was done by a notable, renowned, popular, uh, accomplished cartographer of his time who was commissioned by royalty, right? Which means if you mess up, your job is on the line, your, 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 your livelihood is on the line, and sometimes your life would be on the line. They were not to just mess, mess up official uh, maps for nobles who were going to send armadas out on missions and explorers out to, to reach, you know, various destinations or anything like that. They weren't allowed to just make things up as they went along or guess. Okay. Anyways, this exact same piece of land right here in the middle with the four little island continents, the four rivers that split it and the mountain in the middle can be found on various and numerous older maps um, but not on the modern day maps. So guess what modern academics does? Whoosh, they dismiss it completely. They say, oh, well, they were stupid back then. And they just thought that, you know, they, they had some fairy tales of land that was way up beyond the North for no reason whatsoever, just because they're all dumb. I don't believe that. Not for one second. It doesn't sound logical or convincing or rational to me. Right. Anyways, um, so this is, this is the, the glyph for the Tet. It is a circle with an X right through it. And this is the basket. And this was surrounded by plasma. Now this gets more into my own personal theories. Okay. And less into like anything about Mercator or history or anything like that. These are the puzzle, puzzle pieces I'm putting together. I believe, and I found much evidence to support, and so have many other people across time, not just recently. And it's, you know, not some modern conspiracy theory. People throughout time have thought that this land was the Garden of Eden, that this is the location for the Garden of Eden, for Hyperborea, for Arcadia, for a land that has gone by numerous, multiple different names across the world by different cultures and across time. Okay. All right. So this is not a one-off by Mercator. Um, he actually put this in here many different times in his work, as have other people. Here's another example. This one's done by um, a cartographer named Matthias Quad, I believe his name is, and he has the exact same island. You can see it right here. This is not the exact same map. This is, this is one that was drawn by a totally different person at a totally different time. And you can see they put the same types of things. The gigantic mountain right at the middle, the four rivers that split these lands. The sev this river is always split into seven heads. This one's always split into three. This one's always split into four. And this one's always split into six, giving you 10, boom, boom, alternatively on each side, right? Uh, so here it is again, right? Uh, I'll give you just one more example, but there are many of them, right? This is one that I have featured on my channel recently a few times. Then this one was done by Urbano Monti. This one is a 10 foot by 10 foot map of the world, which by the way, shows Antarctica without any ice. Lots of interesting anomalies on this map. Modern academics won't touch it. They don't, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to acknowledge it. To them, this is fiction and fantasy that somebody obviously put a lot of love and passion and devotion and writing all over this thing and detail. And remember, it's 10 feet by 10 feet, right? This is a huge undertaking. I don't believe that it's just made up or fiction or fantasy at all. Now, let's go back a bit. Let's go back just a little bit here. And uh, let's go back and look at some words. Now that we understand the tet and the island at the middle of our world at the North Pole on these various ancient maps, right? Which we're going to come back to these maps. We're not even done. We're not even close to done. We're going to examine some of these maps close up. But I'm going to switch gears and go back to my other screen real quick. All right, so we're trying to break down the origin of Tartaria. What does it mean? We learned the root already. Tet, that's the root. Ar 
or or meant light or shining, okay? So shining in connection with the tet, the tet and the shine. Uh, sorry, one sec, my computer just wigged out on me. All right. All right, cool. So let's go on to this next slide. Boom. Now, Tartaria. The tet, originally they were called tetars or Tatars or Tatars or however you want to pronounce it, right? But let's look at Tartar because it's also appropriate, right? Tar, if you look up the etymological root of the word tar, it is directly related to this word deru from the Proto-Indo-European uh, root word deru or I mean, it's pronounced the same exact way, but it has a W and it basically means firm, solid and steadfast with a specialized sense of the word wood or tree. Wood or tree is tar. Now, a redundancy is when something happens more than once in, in, in order to emphasize a point, right? So if you have, for example, Jesus, he was known as the king of kings. You could write king, king in old language, and that's what it would mean. It's a redundancy. It means that he is the king of the kings. If you have a tar, tar, that means you have the tree of the trees, or aka the tree of life, the cosmic tree, the world axis, uh, the tree of life that is written about in the Bible, right? So let's go back to our picture here. Boom. And right here in the middle, this gigantic mountain is known as Rupus Nigra et Altissima, which trans, I mean, most commonly called Rupus Nigra, right? Which translates to a high or steep and lofty dark rock, right? Or dark mountain, right? And you can see it kind of almost looks like it has sort of a volcano top going on right there too. I, I put forth a theory that it is a volcano of sorts, okay? But this right here, Rupus Nigra, also affectionately known as Mount Maru, also affectionately known as Olympus, Mount Sinai, all kinds of other holy and special mountains of God in various religions. This is their place. This is where they, they were said to sit. This is where they had gatherings. This is where they congregated, etc. And this was known as the trunk of the world tree. And um, it, the legends Many legends indicate that people could go into and explorers time and time again have gone and sought this place out and they were able to go into this trunk of the world tree or into this central mountain in the middle of the world and enter into a vast, large cavernous opening that took them down into the, the inner recesses of our world. So what happens is this is the trunk and that's why they call it the trunk. The tree part is the plasma, which will shoot out of, um, of many, if not all, of our inner earth entrances, whether they be in the forms of uh, volcanoes or, ca or caves or things like that, right? So when the plasma comes up out of the world, right, it shoots up out of these uh, locations and creates a pillar or a column or a beam of light, which I believe and I have a theory that it is ionized oxygen. Okay. Regardless, these blue, bluish beams of light, which are talked about throughout history. Okay. They are worshiped. There is pole worshiping, pillar worshiping, rod worshiping. There's literally a God called Rod, the Rod God. We, this is the reason for Christmas trees. This is the reason for all of these various decorative poles, maypoles, all these different types of things is because these lights shot up from within the earth and touched the sky, appearing to hold it up to keep it from falling on us, as is the story. And that's the story that we are told, right? So we can use comparative mythology to take all of these many, many different instances of these uh, holy arrows that are shot straight up into the sky in order to uh, stave off some sort of an apocalyptic event, etc. Gaia, hey, good to see you, Gaia. Thank you. Um, so anyways, you get the point, right? This is the location of the largest of those sky pillars, of those sky beams. They don't have them right now. We don't have them in the world right now, not in the age that we live in right now, but there have been ages and times past and, and we have those writings and we have those stories. Most, I mean, most notably to me, some of my favorite stories about these world pillars have come from the Native American tribes um, and their stories that are passed down verbally by word of mouth. 
uh, they talk about that, you know, that there's lands that are held up by four strings or four pillars, or there's a special arrow in Hinduism that, that, you know, one special God can shoot up into the sky, etc. This is, this is what we're talking about. Now, it shoots up as a beam, but because it is plasma and it's affected by the atmosphere and the wind around it, it starts to branch out and create eddies and, and basically branches to the world tree. So let's get back to the tree symbolism real quick. I just wanted to build a bridge to the word that we're, we're studying right now. All right, cool. And if I miss anybody like in the chat or anything, I, I apologize. I'm just, I'm just going to go, I'm going to try to stay on a roll here. All right. So Tartar just like king of, just like Jesus is the king of kings it's a redundancy tartar means the tree of trees the tree of life and if that map does represent the garden of eden that means that that is the location of the tree of life right the fountain of youth etc all right so the tartarians are those from the tree of trees the location of the tree of trees the tartarians if this etymology stands to reason, or if it, if it works out, if it has any merit to it, then it can be assumed, and it can be logically assumed, that anybody who is called a Tartar is a person who is from the location of the tree of the trees, which means that central Hyperborean, beyond the Arctic Circle area that is, um, that is conveyed to us in many of our myths and legends, right? All right, let's continue on. So it comes from the word deru. Remember that, right? That's where we get the word tree. Tree, dri, deru, du, druid, all these different types of words. Oh, so this is just the tet. Um, like I said, it, it represents surround, contain, also mud. It also it also represents mud. Now remember, they in the Bible, it says that humans were made out of mud or clay, right? Which it also says clay right here too. All right, next up, deru. There's deru. So if we look up deru or driu, it's pronounced in different ways. Um, the root meaning is to be firm, solid, steadfast with a specialized sense on wood or tree. Look at all these different related words that come from the root, deru, which means tree. We've got dendrite, right? Which just like the synapses in the brain or the neurons in the brains have little dendrites that sprout out just like your hand. This same exact type of a formation is a tree type of a formation where you have a trunk or a root and then branches and then other branches off of that. Dendro... Uh, druid, like we mentioned earlier, we've also got, uh, let's see, tar, like the substance from the actual tree itself, tray, tree, trig, trim, troth, trow, all these different words. All right. Now, bar, right? I want to mention the barbarians real quick because barbarian is also a redundancy. Okay. It is, it, it, well, it may be a redundancy, but let me explain what I mean. We know what the word bar means, right? It's just a straight line, just like we've talked about with those columns and those pillars that come out of the earth. So if we look up bar, it means, of course, a bar or a barrier, right? So there is this, this import on the fact that it's not just a bar, but it's, it's a bar that prevents you like, a, like, like someone's in jail. It's a barrier. That bar is there to act as a, a sort of a barrier, right? Something that you, you don't cross or whatever. If you have two barriers, or places that you should not cross, or you may cross over into, you have barbar -bar or barbarians. If you're from that area, if you came out of that area, you can be called a barbarian, right? Which is people who are from between these two barriers or the pillars of Hercules, which is said to be on the, uh, the westernmost edges of our world. We all know there is no westernmost edge because in the world that we are given, in the modern age, it just goes on infinitely west or infinitely east, right? West in the old world was a different direction. It was towards the center of the world. These are the four corners of the earth in this, uh, in this map that I showed to you right here, right? This is where the four corners of the earth are located. This is the middle. And it, this gets more into my own personal theories about where the pillars of Hercules are, but I believe we are seeing one of them right here. I believe these are anode and cathode islands, which supply an electrical arc that run over this area right here, this bowl, this crater, and it creates a, an electromagnetic barrier, uh, a dome, basically an electromagnetic dome or a shield that protects and covers this entire island, which also may restrict people on that island to staying on that island and keeping out anybody that is outside of that island, just as it is described in the Garden of Eden. That also 
would help to explain why the word tet has the snake in it, because the snake is the plasma that wraps around in this hyperborean electrical arc. All right, cool. Back to barbarian real quick. Oh, Berber, right? So Berber is also a related word to uh, barbar or barbarians. And it says perhaps ultimately from the Greek barbaros, which is barbar, and then the word oz or oz, you could say, which means strong with, with it's implying very strong, like in like super strong, basically super powered, strong kind of stuff, right? Um, so because Oz means super strong, it means very, very strong. So the very, very strong ones from between the pillars of Hercules. Now here's another related word, mogul, because, um, I, I'm going to show you here on the maps where the word Mongol is directly related. Let's check it out real quick. So you can have a sense of what we're talking about. All right, cool. So here's the original North pole. We're going to use Mercator's map first. Now, if we go up here, towards what I call the Euphrates River, because in the Bible it says that God had split the Euphrates River into seven heads and made it so that people could pass over in sandals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Boom. So I like to call that the Euphrates River. Um, I don't, I'm not convinced and I don't, I haven't seen any evidence that the, the, the renamed river in the Middle East is the actual Euphrates River, nor do I believe that the Tigris right next to it is the actual Tigris. It's missing many other components, um, in order to qualify it. So I disqualify it. This one it, to me is the most qualified candidate for being the actual Euphrates River. So if we assume that people can leave right? Let's say that electromagnetic barrier goes down and they can now leave. This seems the most likely route because look at, there's all these gigantic mountains that surround the entire island. Now, if this side over here of the island, if this side is higher up, then you would have um, less water that's rushing down into it. And then, you know, alternatively, if this side is much lower, you would have a you know, a much wider river, just like you can see here, right? And much less river heads that it splits off into, into these streams. So it's most likely if I lived here, this is the route that I would take in order to leave my homeland of this region in the middle of the world and to spread out and to go exploring into other places, right? And if they did leave here, the Tartarians, or by the way, it's not just Tartarian. Remember, that's just a descriptor. That's all it is. There are many, many different um, tribes of people, lost civilizations, etc., that I believe are related to um, the Tartarians themselves, the same exact tribes that we're talking about, which also gives rise to the concept of the lost tribes of Israel, that many people speculate on who they are and where they went, etc., this is what we're talking about. So let's say that they were trapped here on this island because if there's an electromagnetic barrier or a dome that goes up, when that barrier goes down and the, uh, the, the plasma or the world tree retracts and it goes back into the earth to recharge for another age, which we are in that age right now, which is why we don't see it. Those people have one, you have to remember they're populating in here the entire time, right? So they're going to need to leave. And if you read many of the different Native American myths and legends, their God says, yeah, we were told when we came up out of the earth psh, psh, uh, that we need to go spread out and populate, but that we need to return home. And do you know where they were told that home was? In the center place. In this is literally the center of the world actually physically literally the center of the world anyways so let's say that they were going to leave right they're going to walk across the shallow waters of the euphrates just like it says in the bible right god parted the euphrates so that the people could walk across it they're going to go across the euphrates get on their boats etc i imagine that the current is better on this side than it would be on the other side where all the water is rushing right so they're going to leave this area and the first place that they would come to is this area this region of the world right over here now the first thing we notice is that there is another magnetic mountain. This one says in Latin, polis magnetis uh, respectu insularo capitis viridis, which means this is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to translate it in my head, but there's something to the effect of this is uh, the magnetic pole um, in respect to the island of life or the island of, of green, you could say also too, right? So, <coughs> excuse me, one moment. Stands to reason, 
Going back to the hyperborean electrical arc theory that we were talking about with the anode and the cathode islands, right? That if this is one of the anode or the cathode, I would assume that this would be the cathode island, which would be the island of life, the island that is receiving the most energy and therefore is abundant in life. The other island would be the island of death, which is sort of giving all of its energy away, which we have made reference to and talked about in some other of my prior videos as well. So they would stop right here. They would make a stop on this island of life, or they would scooch around to the nearest continent, which is Asia which is where the Tartarian Empire is said to be on all of these ancient maps, right? So if we take a look, remember, we're still on Mercator's map. You can check this out and you can follow the path of the Tartarians on many of these ancient maps. We stop in a major city that's called Bargu. It's got the word bar in it. That's most notably, I haven't really researched this word, but that just popped right out to me. That's the root is bar, which is a pillar, a beam, a pole, right? Now, if we take another look, You'll notice right up here, it says Tartar Villa, which means city of the Tartars or village of the Tartars, where the Tartars lived. So here we have it again on the map. Now it says Asia. It doesn't say this is Grand Tartary or this is Tartaria or you know anything like that, but it shows you that that tribe of people is represented right here and they were known to be in this particular area. Some people may also know, notice that there is the word Magog or Magog, just as it is talked about in the Bible. In this area on ancient maps, you will find Gog and Magog. Uh, sometimes they go by different names, but sometimes they used the traditional biblical names. So there it is, Tartaria, right over here in Asia, taking the direct route. Now, this entire ocean over here, right? Let's take a look. Right here, it's called the Ocean Scythicus, which means the Scythian Ocean, right? Um, I'm not going to get too deep into the Scythian word right now. But I just wanted to point that out because let's check it. Let's see what it looks like on other maps, right? Uh, let's see. So this is going to be the Matthias uh, Quad map, which is really interesting too. Quad, the dude that made this map, his last name is Quad. I don't know if that's a stage name or a pin name or what, but the Tet has those the four islands or the four rivers, right? Which is the root for Tetra, which means four. <laughs> right? Is it a coincidence? I think not. All right, so let's take a look at this area over here. This one's also called the Ocean of the Scythians, etc., right? You zoom out. Let's take a look at this area. Let's say that they left through the Euphrates or over the Euphrates, came over this way towards this other magnetic mountain that seems to be jutting up out of the ocean and also looks like it has a volcano top on it, right? We can look over. We see the same area, Bargu, just right over there. And let's take another look. Oh, here's got here's Magog. And right here, Tartar. Boom. You see that? So here is an area that that's where the people who were from the Tree of Trees came and they rested here, right? They, they stopped here for a bit. Now, I will also mention this, okay? There are many different tribes that were nomadic. They were wanderers. So let's go back to our other screen real quick and let's check out some more words. Uh, oh, actually, let me let me finish breaking down Mongols. So my point is in these in these areas that I just showed you where the Tartars were known to be. Also, they were sometimes called Mongols, right? And remember, it's not the or it doesn't have to be the original tribe that initially left that central land in the middle of the world. Remember, as they're going about nomadically wandering the world, they're meeting other people who are from the outside world. They're settling down. Some people are making families and babies left and right, etc. And they will also by default be related to the Tartars, etc. Just like the Mongols and many other, many other um, words that describe various types of uh, strong world ruling civilizations and, and whatnot, right? So mon can mean moon or it can be it, it can mean man right? And ghoul basically comes from gel in the Proto-Indo-European, which is this word right here, which means to shine, right? This is uh, the root for like gold. This is why we call gold gold because it is a shiny metal basically, right? There's various different instances of this um, words denoting colors, especially yellow, right? Which is the Tartarian flag color basically. So mon gold means men who shine, 
right? Just like we talked about the light that comes up out of the middle of that island, these people are charged with energy. They're trapped. Hypothetically, let's just assume, you know, let's just, uh, let's just pretend for a bit to say that that's real. These people are trapped in the Garden of Eden, or maybe they're not trapped. Maybe they just like to stay there, but the outside world seems to be trapped by some sort of an electromagnetic barrier, aka a serpent that is twisting itself around the world tree, right? So um, these people are imbued with electromagnetic power and energy, their spirits, their souls, which are electromagnetic in nature, or maybe, right? Or if they are electromagnetic in nature, you can imagine that they would be amplified, that their lights inside would shine, their eyes would shine, that they would glimmer, uh, that they would be known as the shining ones, and that they would have powers much different from those who lived outside of the Garden of Eden uh, or to the south, you could say. So that is a, a po one possibility of the origin of Mongol. Now let's look at nomads because the Tartarians were known to be nomadic in nature, right? Like we talked about, they were told to spread out. And it's not just the Tartarians, right? You can look at the origins for almost any Native American tribe, right? Including South American, South, Southern Native American, whatever, you know, that you want to call them like Aztecs and Mayans and stuff like that too. They have all similar backstories. They were told to wander about and to look for central places and to look for signs in the sky and, you know, to see certain things. And that's the place where you should settle because when they went through this apocalyptic event, the world shifted. Like we were talking about worldwide earthquakes, creating liquefactions, mountains falling, other structures coming up out of the mud. The world's a completely different place on top of that, if it's an electromagnetic reversal, you may have a change in directions where um, where north is now south and south is now north and everybody's backwards and they're lost. They're literally, actually, physically, historically lost tribes. Alpha Kalula, hey, welcome to my channel. All right, uh, man, so Nomad, let's check this out. It says right here, related to Nomos which means pasture, pasturage, or grazing, and literally land that is allotted or left over and to be given to, right? From the Proto-Indo-European root word nim, which means assign, allot, or take. Like, like, like if you're playing poker, uh, whatever's left over is your take from the pot, right? From, from all the chips that people put into the pot or whatever, that's a take, something that is left over uh, is a nim. It's the root of nomo or nemo. Nemo just means of the nim, which means of the leftovers, of the survivors of the apocalypse. Those people or beings or creatures that survived a, cat a, a catastrophic worldwide event, they became known as the nim or the nemo. They're the ones who had access into these secret mountain areas and, and whatnot. Um, which is why you'll in my truth in movie segments, you'll see the name Nemo comes up pff, all the time, <laughs> all the time for uh, for these types of characters, right? They're always called Nemo. Many there's many different versions. The Secret of Nim, that's another one, right? Anyways, this is what nomads are. They are uh, they are basically leftovers from the apocalypse, right? People who survived the apocalypse. Um, that happened. There's two different types of apocalypses. There's one where the energy comes up, those domes go up at the middle of the world and all the energy, all the all of our environment or our atmosphere is electrified, giving rise to different forms of um, dress, different forms of architecture, different forms of other things because we have to adapt to our new world, right? All right. Uh, let's see. What are we looking at now? Hold on. Let me go back here. All right, that's good. I think we covered that pretty good. So that's why they're called the nomads, okay? They were the survivors who walked around trying to find a place to live in a world that was already settled by everybody else, right? They had to go into the wildernesses um, because they they would not be welcome in, in um, major populated towns and cities because they would be seen as weirdos, strangers, yahoos, crazies. You know what I mean? Because they were babblers. People had an entirely different language. I believe possibly telepathy, right? Maybe they lost their tel telepathic abilities whenever they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden and the electromagnetic um, energy was retracted and went back down into the world. And then they slowly, they stopped having the ability to communicate with one another telepathically and they have to start developing a language, right? Which is probably going to be much different than already established languages worldwide. So whenever you have these strangers 
who are imbued with some kind of energy or something, who seem to be very powerful, walking about, uh, looking for lands to settle, all of the regulars, all of the locals will start panicking and they'll start, you know, putting their guards up and they're not going to allow, you know, thousands upon thousands of wanderers to just come in and take over their cities or be a part of it. They don't know who they are. They don't know where they're from. They called them the babblers or, or, or whatnot. You know what I mean? People that were crazy and weird and strange and had all these different customs and stuff. So they forced them, many of these major areas forced them to continue being nomadic in nature, even though many times, and you can find proof of it time and time again on these maps. If you translate these maps, um, there are many accounts of people who developed relations with these people, which gave rise to families. You know what I mean? As, as trust built over time, built up over time. Um, and they spread out. You know what I mean? Like some of those people settling down or whatnot, but the rest of them continued on and continued to be nomadic. Those who were not continuing to be nomadic settled would have, or it stands to reason that they would settle down and they would continue to mix into that other culture. And they would, they would, uh, what's the word? Dissimilate or whatever? Disseminate? I forgot. Well, they would basically, they would, um, they would just mix into, and then they would, they would lose their origin. They would become lost. Some of us, I believe, are we are related to people who have been mixed in and lost in, in the rest of the world during a time right now where I feel like we're also probably being called back to our origins. All right, let's take a look at this map right here. It says Tartaria on it. Uh, let's see. Uh, this one's just a picture. I can't zoom in on this one too much, but as you can see, it's got China down here. And sometimes they actually show you the Great Wall of China, which is really interesting. Um, there's some stuff on these, uh, there's Bargu, that one bar, the Bargu one, uh, Mer Glacial. This one's really interesting too. Let me show you something about that, that, that ocean. I want, I forgot to make my point about that. So let's go back to that, but let's use a different map. Let's use the Urbano Monte map. And, uh, let's see, we're going to go find Bargu, which is right over here. There it is, Bargo, Bargo, Bargo. As you can as you can see, vowels and letters shifted and changed with dialect and accent and and whatnot over time, right? So if we look over here, it's now called the Ocean of Tartaria, or the Mare Tartaro, the Ocean of Tartaria. This is the Tartarian Ocean. This boat right here, these are Tartarians. Some people would say Phoenician. That sits well with me too. Totally fine because the place of the Phoenix is right here. This is where the Phoenix comes out. This is that beam that shoots up and branches out and it looks like it's got wings and feathers because it's an aura up there in the sky. And uh, sometimes it looks like a person or Atlas holding up the world or the sky or whatnot, <coughs> or holding up a different world or the sky. Anyways, um, so that's where the Phoenicians would also come from, the place of the Phoenix or the, the fiery bird that's up there in the sky, the cosmic bird, the thunderbird. Uh, you know, there's many different names for that, that, that type of trope in history. Anyways, so this is the ocean of Tartaria. So it stands to reason that if they were maritime in nature and they were used to riding on these rivers back and forth in order to trade with one another, um, which by the way, they were also known to be followers of Hermes or Hermes Trismegistus or the thrice great. Um, they were traders, they were mercs, they were merchants, etc., and so on and so forth. They were very much all about trading with people because they were nomadic and that's that was their life. They bartered right? So the place where people bartered was Bargo, where they, they set up their area. We did talk about the word Bargo and its relationship to the word embargo, which means to keep people from using their boats to come in and trade with you, right? I believe that there's a direct correlation to that as well. Uh, and if we look here, you can see all of these little tents. You see how they have all of these little Middle Eastern looking uh, tents all over the place? These This is a Tartarian style of tent structure, right? They were tent dwellers. Okay. They lived in tents. If you read the old Testament, you can find billions of different examples of the tent dwellers, even festivals that were dedicated to dwelling in tents and setting up tents, etc., and being nomadic in nature. Um, but anyways, this is the area where they settled. So they would have came down right over the Euphrates, came down this way, maybe stopped on the Island of Life. I probably would have stopped there myself. Maybe not. I don't know. But either way, they definitely settled in this area over here. Uh, we'll bypass the unicorn and all that other fun stuff. And we'll do that another time. But then 
this entire region, this whole ocean was taken over by the Tartarians, right? Who claimed it. Basically, this was their territory. This was their area. And they were the merchants. They were in charge of going back and forth and trying to trade with people and find things to trade with. And they seemed to have a knowledge that the outside world was not privy to. And they used that knowledge to their advantage to be successful, right? Successful as as newcomers, as the noobs of the world, right? So they came out and they started um, being merchants and sailing about, and they were very good at it, etc. Especially in a world that may not be used to sailing, right? They lived, if they lived in this island right here, it stands to reason that they would be good at sailing and using these rivers as passageways to get places a lot quicker, right? Um, and if if that's true, right? Let's say that there was a time whenever there was much less ocean, which I can also show you a lot of evidence for as well, right? Because I believe these two cyclicals, these, cycle, these cycles that we go through are one where it's a water world, one where it's an ocean world, right? And one where the oceans are removed and taken away. Imagine all of those outsiders who are not used to an ocean being all over the place and so much water, and they're not used to a water world, right? All of a sudden they live in one. All of a sudden, you have these Phoenicians coming in, and they're like, "Yeah, we we know how to do all that. We can build ships. We we can show you how to, you know, um, advance your your technology when it comes to your shipbuilding and stuff like that." Anyways, all right, let's go back to this other uh, sharing thing that I have. All right, we're gonna we're gonna go on to this next image here. So here's another picture of uh, the region of Tartaria, right? I think Bargo should be somewhere in here somewhere. I can't really, I can't. Let me see if I can zoom into this one. Oh, this has got some really cool stuff on it too. All of these do. Here's that same Tartarian tent type structure, right? They took tents with them wherever they went because they were nomadic in nature. When they were not, sometimes you'll see that they settled. Sometimes they actually built little cities and stuff because nobody was out there in the wilderness or the greater Tart Tartary areas, right? So they felt free to sort of settle in 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 abandoned areas or areas where others were too scared to go because we all in the outside tend to congregate right in these little metropolitan areas and we i mean even in the city where i live like there's a whole wilderness all i have to do is a go a few miles in one direction and there's like miles and miles hundreds of miles of nothing where there's no cities nobody's living there it's just empty land that nobody's using so imagine that some wanderers or our modern homeless people all decided hey there's no cops out there there's like there's nobody watching over that land it, you know, obviously some rich person put a fence around it or whatever, but why? You know what I mean? Like they're not using it or anything and they'd all settled and they brought tents and they slept out there. That is just like the Tartarians basically. All right. Uh, let's see. It's, I don't think there's anything else on this. I wanted to really point out on this one because I want to get to these other maps where I can zoom in. It's just another example of Grand Tartary or Greater Tartaria, the, the greater region where the Tartars or the Tatars lived. This is the area. This was not an official recognized nation or, you know, as we have them today with like all of our boundaries and borders, these, these boundaries and borders were imagined by those who are on the outside because that's their mentality is a boundary and border mentality. Uh, the Tartars and other tribes didn't have that type of a mentality. They were more of a, let's, Hey, let's share the world kind of mentality, right? Like there are no borders and boundaries, et cetera. Uh, here's another example of it. You can see it looks like maybe China. Yeah, this is the Great Wall of China over here, Tartaria, etc. Okay, I'm actually going to come back to that map. All right, I think I'm done sharing these particular images. So let's check out these maps once more. All right, cool. So uh, let's see. We talked about this one. We talked about Gog and Magog. I'm just. I'm just kind of giving myself mental notes here. Let me see what else we got. Oh, yeah, this one too. So I'm going to show you some other stuff too. So let's go back to this Urbano Monti map. 1587, by the way, right? This was made in 1587. Like it, it, this was a labor of love. Hold on, let me zoom out here. All right, where are we? Here's the United States. All right, so I'm going to show you the area where the Tartars were said to be. And then I'm going to show you other areas where they were also known to be. 
So this is the region where we were just were. Here's Bargo, right? Just like on the other maps, we saw that Bargo area where there's like Gog and Magog and stuff like that. Here's their ship. Here's the, the ocean of Tartaria, the Sea of Tartaria, etc. right? So this is the same area where they acknowledge and they put those borders and they say, this is the Tartarian zone. Like this is, this is, this, you'll, this is the Tartarian's area, right? But Although it doesn't say that on this map, it, it does show many places where they are, right? Here's those Tartarian tents. Once again, I'll, I'll fling it around here. Boom. You can see there's more of these Tartarian tents spread across and goes all the way down into this area. Now imagine this. Imagine that the Tartarians or similar tribes or lost tribes, they left the Garden of Eden. They came down over the Euphrates. They came down into this particular area down here. They continued to go southward and circular as they spread out and became nomadic and settled down and met people and had families and whatnot. And they came all the way down and you can, you can find this whole trail of uh, tents and stuff like that. They came all the way down. You could see their, some one of their ships right here between the Caspian and I believe the Black Sea. Look, there's a sea monster, mean old sea monster right there. Jesus, hold on, I want to see that real quick. Dang, look at that thing. <laughs> all right, anyways, um, so they came down. My point is, imagine they continued to go down. Right? They continued to come all the way down between these areas and they, and they took their knowledge right, from their lands, from where they're from, and they started teaching the locals who they might have seen as being savage, which is the inverse of what the locals saw. The locals thought that the other ones were savage. They, they both thought that each other were savages, basically. But they come down and they start teaching them agriculture and technology and how to do things in a different way. And it gets down into like India and stuff like that. And then you have, you have these stories that corroborate this of these um, tribes and nations of people that came down from the Caucasus region, which is this exact same Tartarian type of area, right? Came down and started, you know, trying to help out other people who were locals in that area. And they do this everywhere. They do this all over the place. Let me show you an example. Let's go to the United States, actually. Let's turn the map around. All right, let's zoom out so you can get calibrated. Here's South America down here. Here's like Mexico and stuff. Here's Florida. So here's the United States. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm familiar with that. I'm sorry if you're from another country. Um, and you, you'll notice California is two Californias, actually. There's one California here and there's a split California. I'm not going to talk about that right now, though. Let's get into Canada in this northern area. Up here, you will find remnants of Tartaria, right? You see these uh, tents right here? Same exact tents. Same exact Tartarian structures. This is why it's important to take note of um, archaeology and um, you know building structures and and things like that. And it says right here, T A R T A R I. That means of the Tartarians. This is another encampment of the Tartarian Empire who settled all the way around this entire. Uh, northern circle, right? The, now, the further south you get, the less Tartarian type structures and references and stuff you'll find. However, if you do a little circle around these old maps and you just read what it says in older German or Latin or Italian or, or, or whatnot, and if you just look at the pictures, you don't even have to to translate anything. Just look at the, the images and you will find remnants of the Tartarian uh, tribe. I will call them. And I don't, I don't like to call them like a nation because then that, that gives the image of like a country and borders and boundaries and stuff. But you can see they were not restricted to Grand Tartaria whatsoever. That's just the place where they flooded in. That was the, the place where, the, where they, that was their entrance point, basically. This is a theory that I have about that. I'm sure there was others who may have been able to leave this island in the middle and go in other directions. But like I said, if it was me, this is probably the route that I would take. <coughs> Pardon me. All right, cool. So there's many different examples of, of Tartarian structures and whatnot, not simply in Asia, not just in Russia, not just in the Middle East or Siberia, but all over the world. And as you can imagine, if you compare, right, various cultures and tribes like the Inuit or uh, the, the Northern Native Americans, even down into Mexico, the Aztecs, etc., you can find the correlation that these stories have with one another their history, their stories, their origins of where they came from. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Oh, this is really cool. So this is a, a website I like to talk about and give reference to quite, quite often. 
It's called David Rumsey Map Collection or davidrumsey.com. If you're into zooming into these interesting maps, like we're going to zoom into this uh, Tartarian map right here, this is the spot. You can get high quality and zoom all the way. It doesn't get blurry or anything. Look at that. It's beautiful, right? I zoomed like I'm right in front of it. And this is probably even better than if it had the map in front of my face. This is probably better than what my eyes could see, right? There's a lot of detail that went into these that the modern age would just dismiss as being fantasy, right? So as you can see here, it's got this Tartarian structure type of a tent, the tent dwellers, the nomads, right? Um, with a point at the top. They didn't have to build their tents with points. They could have made domes. They could have made a, any other type of structure, um, but they have this sort of teepee type of a look to them. I believe that there is a reason for that because the teepee and this type of a structure are directly related because the people are directly related to one another. Now, let's check it out. Up here at the very top, I want to show you this. It says Mare Septentrionale, which is really interesting. I'm going to do a, a presentation, another presentation on this one, one day, but it's been mistranslated as the Northern Ocean. That's not what it says whatsoever whenever you do an etymological study on that word, but it is it is the northern area basically right now we could take a look at this and you could see all kinds of interesting details uh you can see the tartarians you could, they looks like they used camels an awful lot right a lot of camels and stuff in their travels also i pointed out on the urbano monte map in an earlier presentation um where it highlights where great danes come from and that the tartarians seem to have brought giant dogs with them from the middle of the world and they had these huge massive dogs that were trained to help them out and hunt and protect them and they were parts of the family or whatnot now uh this looks like it's the caspian sea right here right so we're, we're at the same type of area that we were looking at i don't know what some of this is i just want to check it out looks like this dude's got bow and arrow on horseback with a shield it's kind of cool. All right. Uh, i did want to point out something that was notable on this particular map which is these stories i love translating these stories if i love looking for weird pictures and anomalies and strange stuff and if it's got words man i'm going to probably read it like this is clearly you can see that's not english that's not the language that i natively speak or anything but look at the picture we've got a picture of what looks like some sort of devout followers or religious group of people who are all down on their knees with their hands up into the air and then some something's being poured on them or or sprinkled on them or something by this guy who's up in a tree holding on to some sort of like bucket or something like that. And if you look behind him, it's almost reminiscent of rumors about the Wizard of Oz and that creepy forest of the Wicked Witch or whatnot, right? But they've got all these dead people that are just hanging. It's a gallows, right? Isn't that weird? It's such a strange combination of these happy worshipers, some weird guy in a tree right and then all these dead people who are hanging on the tree so i'm like i gotta i gotta translate this i gotta figure out what this means right so i did translate it for all of you um you can translate it on your own as well if you'd like to um this is latin by the way which is known as the dead language but not if you know it <laughs> like if you know it i highly recommend you know becoming familiar with it because it can be very helpful in retracing our steps in the past and figuring out who we are and where we came from all right so i'm not going to read it in latin i'm just going to read the translation because it i feel like that would be a lot easier and it translates this it says the kirgis the kirgesi people live in groups that is in hordes and he has a a ritual of this kind when the priest performs the divine ritual he takes the blood milk and the dung of cattle and he mixes it with earth into which he pours a certain vessel or he, pour, he pours it into a certain vessel but this sprinkling is given and worshipped for the god when anyone dies among them they hang them from the trees instead of being buried so this is like you know uh, for me it's a that's incredible kind of a moment right? Where I'm like, wow, like this is so interesting. This was such an interesting and strange thing to whoever made this map that it's it's like they made like a little Sunday comics kind of insert like, hey, by the way, check this out. This is a strange, interesting thing that's happening over here, right? And this is this whole Tartarian like 
map basically. And this is just one thing that I found. You can check it. There's other stuff on here that I have yet to translate or what it not. Like there's something going on up here with these people on their knees. And it looks like they're worshiping a statue of a woman in some sort of a headdress or hoodie cape type deal and a baby. Interesting. Sort of a Madonna and, and baby Jesus type of a thing. Uh, we've got Angel. Hey, thank you, Angel. Uh, we've got these guys who are all down on their knees and worshiping a pole, what looks to be like a pole or a cross type of a beam structure, right? Uh, so very interesting stuff there. Now let's move on. Uh, let's see, we got something else I just wanted to point out since we talked about the Mongols and their relationship to the Tartarians, right? It doesn't mean that they are Tartarians. Remember, they interbred. They, as they, not all of them, some stuck to their families and they said, no, we're going to stay nomadic. We're going back home one of these days and we're going to stick to that. So that's where that whole sense of nationalism or whatever, that's where all that disdain comes from. The outsiders, they, they don't like that, right? They don't like that there's others who are not willing to mix with them or, or, or whatever, historically speaking, right? Anyways, I got to watch. I got to be careful. <laughs> All right. Where were we? Uh, let's see. Let's let's go to the Mughal, right? So just like the Mongols, we have the Mughal Empire. And uh, the Mughal Empire was an early modern empire that controlled much of South Asia. I'm not going to read this entire article. I'm going to sum it up right now. Basically that the M Mughal Empire uh, is conveniently said to have been founded in 1526 by somebody called Babar or Babur right? Uh, and they are directly related to the Mongols or the word I should say is directly related to Mongols. As a matter of fact, let's do a quick search and I'll bet you we'll find it. Uh, one moment. I'm just going to search this page and type in Mong, Mongol. Boom. There it is. All right. So what do we have here? It says they use the use of Mughal or Mogul derived from the Arabic and Persian corruption of Mongols. So there you have it. It's a direct correlation to the Mongols or the shining men, right? The men of shine, the men of gl the glowing people. I don't know what else, you know, you could call it different things. It's all the same stuff. And it emphasized the Mongol origins of the Timurid dynasty, right? So the same people, they continued on, they pushed in South, they got into, you know, politics or, you know, they became regulars of locals and whatnot. You know, you know, they had children who became native born, etc. They worked their way into be being accepted by the outsiders, basically, right? Um, and also a mogul is somebody who is like a powerful person who's in charge, right? Which is what these people are said to have been. They're said to be very powerful, very strong, very good at dealing with uh, maritime laws, uh, merchant laws. They were traders. They were all about business. They were all about trading things and not not to take advantage of people. I, I know that that's what it's turned into our in our modern day where we live in a time where we have exponential entropy in our world and, and we can't imagine anyone being righteous or pure or have good intentions, let alone an entire nation of people doing that. But this is how it began. They were wise, they were intelligent, and they knew um, that it's a good idea to trade something. And if somebody's willing to give you something that is more valuable to you and less valuable to them, that it's wise to accept that trade. So they were like, yes, let's do that, you know, and we'll be successful. And, you know, now that's given rise to many different other standards in our world today. And uh, I think we'll leave off just with the, uh, the pro, the pro -selenes. Okay. So this is a little bit kind of on the side of a topic, right? I feel like it's directly related because I, I feel Right, I've made many connections that these these empires in this area in this region that we look at the center of the world and those who migrated out of the center of the world, right, walking about in circles around their holy mountain, but just further away as they were nomads and wandered about, etc. Right, um, I believe that they or their ancestors, while they lived here, they lived during a time where there was no moon. They saw the creation of what we call the moon. Now that gets very deep and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time in this particular presentation explaining what the moon really is or where it comes from or what my theories on that are just because I, I feel like we've had a good presentation about Tartaria already and I don't want to change the subject. But check out my playlist, my Plasma Apocalypse playlist 
and you can see various thumbnails that and 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 descriptions and titles about the moon where i talk about the origins of the moon and my theories on where the moon actually is what the light in the sky is that we call the moon and the sun and all of that fun stuff too but anyways these people would have been the proselenes which means before the moons or the pre-lunar people the people who saw the creation of the moon i will remind you at this point in time modern academics has no idea they have four wild theories that don't stand up to a lot of uh, questioning and they all conflict with one another about where the moon came from in the official uh, record of things, right? So these people would bring with them stories that are ancient, that are before our modern age, right? Uh, stories of the creation events of our world, the sky, the ground, the earth, the mountains, the seas, the oceans, deserts, um, and that gets into magic and mysticism and all kinds of things that we have since collectively forgotten about because it's been so much time that has passed. Uh, and I believe that that's the end of my presentation for today. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something and, and you know, I hope you take something of value from this presentation. And if you really like it, I hope that maybe you'll share it out with, you know, others that might appreciate it and get something from it as well. Thanks for watching. I hope you have a good weekend. And until next time, I'm Jay Dreamers saying good vibes and goodbye.
Oh.